you ready? Are you ready for Randy? Hey, Randy. Hi, how are you guys? Hey, Randy. <laughs> hey. Did you hear that little song just then, Randy? I did. I tuned yeah, in just good. in time. <laughs> and did you? Uh, and Randy, did you like it? Uh, no. Right. Uh, sure. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no. Hello, welcome back to The Fast and The Curious, the podcast, the show that dives deep into the world of the mad sport that is Formula One. We like to speak to everyone, don't we, guys? Oh, yeah. Speak to everyone. Speak to anyone, I will. Oh, Eddie, yeah. Speak anyone, to anyone, we will. Yeah, anyone yeah. that will speak to us. I'm <laughs> Betty Glover. What's your name? <laughs> My name's Christian Hugill. And me, well, I'm Greg James, and I'm the team principal of this ship. And it's great this to be ship. ship. I thought you said something else then. I thought that was very derogatory about your own podcast, but <laughs> ship with a P. It's okay, good. Great. Great to all be back together. You've had very busy summers, all of you. You've been rolling apples down the hill at Zanvor. Yeah, I have. You've been doing the Euros and then the Olympics. Yeah, tired. Incredible. We should have got someone who's, you know, a proper sports broadcaster with a proper CV and doing these minor <laughs> little rubbishy <laughs> tournaments like the European Championships and the Olympics. And we give you a, a race debrief after every race. Tends to be on a Sunday. Tends to be. Not always. No, start of the year. It wasn't. Some of them were on they, Saturday. They were on Saturday, they were. So we give you a race debrief after every race and we give you some special guests when we're in the studio together. And today, one of our <laughs> favourite guests, we'll be speaking to McLaren's racing director, Randy Singh. He'll be on very soon for a catch-up. Looking forward to chatting to him about what it was like to be on the pit wall at the Dutch Grand Prix when Lando won again. His second Formula One race victory. What else is going on today, Betty Glover? Well, Greg James. We obviously need to talk about Logan Sargent, who's come on this podcast so many times. We're big fans of Logan Sargent, but of course he's been dropped by Williams. So we're going to talk yeah. all about that situation because that happened this week as well. I feel so like I'm it's, sort of it's in, in mourning news. a bit. Mm. Yeah. Like I feel quite sad about that. It is sad. Mm. It is sad. I do like, he's a lovely, lovely man. Yeah, we'll dig into that later. I feel like maybe we sh- all should have worn black or something. I mean, he's not died, but no. you know. It's, uh, it's still sad. To show our morning. Um, but we've had a lot of questions in asking about his replacement and why this has happened now. That they've replaced him with Franco Colapinto. So we're going to tell you everything that you need to know about him because I don't know I don't know a huge amount about him. I won't lie. No, it was a name that uh, popped up on, on Instagram and I went, oh, yeah, I don't know who that is. I know him and I'm aware of his work and a little bit later on the podcast we'll tell you a bit about him. Great. Well, I'm glad someone knows a bit about I mean, I am here to be the sort of resident F1 geek. Yeah, it'd be mad if you didn't know who he was. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've never, never, never bloody heard of him. No, uh, I... <laughs> I, mean, I, I guessed the... he was F2 and F3. He's yeah. come from there, but I, I hadn't hadn't heard the name myself. No. What, what else are we doing? Well, episode? we're gonna we're gonna talk about a little bit of Mercedes news mm. that we're gonna pin on the George Russell Community Notice Board. Oh, yeah. We need one of those in here, by the way. We do, don't Greg. we? Shall I speak to the art department? Yeah. Producer Jimmy. Yes. Can you <laughs> go and book an art department? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to ask for a notice board. Yeah. You actually asked for an arts yeah, department. Well, I want an arts department. I think, I think, we, oh, okay, I think we deserve good. one. It's recruitment yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it yeah. needs to be five people. Five. <laughs> <laughs> Five very talented artists. Oh, God. I feel like we've got to the point now where we probably need to introduce Randy Singh yeah, and actually speak to him now. So yeah, yeah. let's say hello to the brilliant Randy Singh, McLaren's racing director. Hey, Randy. Welcome back on the podcast. Hi. Lovely to see you all again. Where, whereabouts are you? So you're in Monza. Yeah, I'm in another hotel room in Italy, uh, different to the one from last time. It's uh, yeah, not flooded outside. It's nice and sunny. Um, but yeah, working from the hotel today. It looks very white and pristine, that hotel. It's a lovely Hilton hotel room. So. Oh, thanks oh, to our friends, oh, thanks to our friends at Hilton. Smooth plug. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've been bitten by the Hilton bug as well at Silverstone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Randy, welcome back. Congratulations, you're smashing it. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, yeah, no, it's good to get some good results. And uh, yeah, a lot of hard work from the whole team um, over many years is uh, paying off, which is lovely to see. More than paying off. That car's bloody quick, isn't it? Oh, so oh my God. fast. Yeah, quick uh, and reliable. Uh, and the team at the track did a good job to make sure there weren't any sort of uh, gotchas or anything. So, yeah, like a re- really a team effort to get it there. But, yeah, the car was very quick in uh, Zandvoort. It wasn't just very quick, Randy. It was an absolute bloody rocket ship. And I said that Lando could really do with coming out and laying down a marker on, you know, Max's home turf. But I never in my wildest imagination thought 
that you guys would win by 22 seconds. Did you guys, or was the sheer pace in that car a shock to you guys as well? Yeah, I wouldn't say it was a shock. Like, um, we have a very sort of steady approach to stuff. Lots of uh, small upgrades coming through the year. Um, you know, we try not to focus on what the result may look like. I think it was a, a little bit of a surprise of how quick we were relative to everyone else. But we expected to be decently quick in Zandvoort. Um, and yeah, you just like, actually, to be honest, you spend most of your time in the race thinking, OK, we're a bit quicker than we thought. What does that mean? Uh, you get different problems in the race and you talk about different things. Just make sure you don't miss anything just because you're quick and a little bit sort of uh, pleasantly surprised at how quick you are. What was the pit wall like, Randy? Because it must have been, you must have been buzzing, but then, you know, after a while you're like, well, we've, we've definitely won this because <laughs> look at how far ahead he is. So was there still all of that excitement or was it just sort of a bit calmer at the end? Uh, you definitely never think uh, we've definitely won this. Like that certainly doesn't go through our heads. Uh, if anything, on Lando's side of the sort of pit wall operations, we were concentrating quite a lot on how could this go wrong so you start thinking about those one or two percent things that would affect a normal race where now those are the only things that can go wrong so you're thinking about all that side uh, of things and on oscar's side um we had some work to do to try and get ourselves as far up as possible so it was quite a um quite a strategically interesting race there we could have gone early which we talked about we decided to go later build tire delta um so yeah so you, you stay the same level of busyness the same level of sort of pressure and stress because you're trying to evaluate all the options and what could go wrong <laughs> yeah the same levels of anxiety whether you're the fastest car or the slowest car it's a, it's just a different <laughs> different uh, levels of happiness i guess but the, there was an interesting bit wasn't there where you said to lando if there was a safety car now would you be happy on the tires you're on have i got that right and so it's those sorts of conversations, which are good problems to have, but they are, as you said, still problems, aren't they? So there's still, it's never won until it's won. Yeah, 100%. You have to think through all the kind of things that could go wrong. Uh, and, you you know, we talked to Lando a lot during the race. We talked to Oscar a lot during the race. Um, often it's not things that uh, we haven't discussed before. And sometimes there's uh, neat ways of asking that stuff, referring back to what we were talking about the evening before when we're preparing for the race. Um, so you'll, you'll hear us asking lots and lots of questions. Um, sometimes it's just to make sure that Lando also, Lando and Oscar also know what we're thinking on the pit wall without giving it away to everyone. Mm. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> That's true isn't it yeah that's really hard Randy could Lando win the drivers championship uh, I think at the moment our approach Christian is just to just to try our best with both championships uh, uh, they're both going to be difficult to win uh, we've got strong competitors like, mathematically it's possible um, but like really we just focus on getting the most out of every single race learning as much as we can from you know all the opportunities and the small mistakes that we make and just seeing where we get to but yeah we try not to worry too much about um, can we win this championship or that championship? Um, just because that might distract us from, you know, just constantly having those small marginal gains and trying to get there. Christian, Greg, do you think that Lando Norris can win the Drivers' Championship? <laughs> um, Look at Randy's little face. I think he can, <laughs> yes, undoubtedly. My worry would be that exactly as Randy says... Not everybody knows how fast you're going to be track by track. And at the moment, I can't remember a Formula One season where, look, just before the break, we had Mercedes wins. At the start mm. of the season, we had Ferraris wins. And what I'm sure Randy and McLaren will be working on is making sure that if a Red Bull doesn't win, it it needs to be us. Because, Randy, that it is so open at the front, isn't it? And it's not like we're in a situation where we know for a fact if, if if Max doesn't win, Lando will. Because you've also got, you know, Lewis has picked up race wins, George has won a race and could have won a, a second. It's competitive up there, isn't it, for you guys? Yeah, like uh, you look at the end of the race and there's a, a margin of over 20 seconds, but that boils down to three tenths a lap pretty much. Um, and we see swings of a tenth, two tenths here or there. People bring upgrades. Nowadays, upgrades tend to be on the smaller side in terms of absolute lap time. But like, you know, a tenth or two tenths, you see people bring those upgrades. Um, it can swing very quickly. And the, the exciting thing and the worrying thing is that there's three or four teams that can compete for wins within that range of a few tenths up or down. So it can very easily swing from a team finishing first and second to then finishing seventh and eighth and the point swings are massive and that's why i think it's possible of course it's possible look at last weekend but it's but uh, you know 
I'm sure Randy won't mind me saying, you know, it's still 75 points, isn't it? You know, it's a it's a big old gap, but you know, it's it's possible. It's definitely possible. Mathematically possible. Yeah, 70, I believe. Christian in the Ooh. drivers and 30 in the Thank constructors. <laughs> there we go, what Christian. Did I say? What did I say? Did I say 75? <laughs> and that's Yes, and that's yeah. why Randy got his big promotion. Congratulations <laughs> on that, by the way. Thank you very much. Congrats, Randy. What What's it like now in your new role? How, how is your race day different? Um, to be honest, uh, there's large bits of similarity. I'm still very heavily involved on the strategy and the sporting side. So, um, and our structure is sort of constantly evolving to just make sure we operate at the best that we can. Um, and there've been a, actually there've been a few races where I've stepped in as. Uh, a strategist on one of the cars because we've had a few sort of uh, people missing for a race or two here or there. Um, so it's been quite fun doing the whole spectrum of stuff. Um, but the main thing is just trying to help keep a bigger eye on the whole weekend. Are we missing any big risks? Um, are there any things that we should be focusing on? Uh, trying to make sure that we have a, a good plan and a good thread of how we approach stuff through the whole weekend. Um, it's really fun. It's like you get a bigger overview of stuff um andrea is really good at helping me understand like the kinds of things that he used to focus on and that like i can pick up on his behalf um yeah you just get a really wide picture of the whole race weekend doesn't matter how much of a big dog you are you still get a a cape don't you when you win a race (laughs) show us your cape randy (laughs) oh the cape i thought you said cake there was definitely no cake um there's a bit of cake knocked around oscar piastri's nan getting some cake or something (laughs) lamington yeah so this is uh i think a zandvoort special because we We've never, I've never seen a winner's cape before, but this is the uh, winner's cape. And uh, this is the winner's cape. Winner's cape like, that's yeah, a normal lovely. thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we also have a, a winner's have cap as well, which uh, our team produce. Have you worn the cape yet? Uh, we did. Uh, most of us wore it for the team photo after the after the race. So you're not wearing it in the morning while you're making your eggs or something. <laughs> that's what I would do. <laughs> I wore it for our leadership huddle yesterday, and I was incredibly <laughs> appreciative that Zach also turned up in a cape because otherwise I'd have felt a bit silly. <laughs> oh, of course he did. <laughs> are, are capes the done thing for? Is this a, a Dutch thing? Was it a, I don't know. It, I don't what was this? I've never heard of this before. No, I've never you, seen a cape Randy, in the for the benefit before. of the listeners who aren't watching on YouTube, he just held up a, a, a bright orange, actual like Superman cape. So what? why why has this happened? I mean, I like it. It's good nonsense, but why has it happened? I have no idea. Don't ask me. I think uh, the Dutch Grand Prix, okay. they've been very good at like giving out souvenirs each year. So occasionally they've given out Max Verstappen capes, uh, hats, I think, one year. So I think it's just along those lines. But that's a McLaren cape. Do they make a cape for everyone? <laughs> and then <laughs> just chuck the others in the bin? I don't think they bothered with a Haas cape, did yeah, they? Let's be honest. I was going to say, there would there'd definitely be some teams you wouldn't bother with. <laughs> This is, very, this is very mean. This is very rude. But hey, no, it's happened in the past. You know, freak mm. wins have happened. So maybe you it's do true. have to. Mm. The one time you don't make a Haas cape, there'll be rain and a safety car and K-Mag will win it. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question about your, your levels of excitement over the weekend? Did you allow yourself to get excited when you saw Lando zooming past Max in actual open racing? Uh, and <laughs> do you have to sort of then contain that very quickly because you've got a whole race to, to manage? But did you have a moment of, oh my God, God, it's happened. It's definitely, um, it's definitely nice to see that. I, I check my, I record my heart rate each race, and I check back, and actually my heart rate didn't really change, and just, and was actually quite low during that phase of the race. So I think <laughs> um, hopefully just shows that we're just concentrating on. Okay, well, what does this mean? You know, right. sometimes when you pass someone, uh, this time it was earlier in the race, but sometimes when you pass someone, you have to immediately decide to pit to lock that position in, or they may pit to get mm. it back, and so it's actually quite a busy period because you're trying to work all of that out as well. Right. That's what a what a great answer. And you so you mm. you've looked back at your heart rate throughout the race. So talk about did, strategist. Did you yeah. uh, did you allow yourself to get excited when you won? <laughs> what did what did the chart say? Uh, no, <laughs> I think the chart just says that I'm a very boring person who. Uh, <laughs> no, Randy, that's, that's not, not the true. Case. No, you're not boring, but you might be dead inside. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the chart seems to suggest it. It, go, it goes up a little bit around the pit stops, um, but like a tiny bit, and then goes a bit up yeah. up at the end of the race when uh, people are congratulating you. And Zach's quite strong, so yeah. What about when you got your little cape? Did you get a, Did you get a spike on the heart monitor there? <laughs> <laughs> I'd stop recording by then, unfortunately. <laughs> do, do you feel like the pressure is now on? Like you're starting to feel the pressure now? Because this season, there's a lot of stake now, suddenly. Yeah, I'd say it's fair to say we've had some races where we've come out of them thinking we had 
good opportunities to do better. And I think the team is brilliant. Like there's no blame. Like you just get on with analyzing what you could do better and so on. So when you come out of these races, you obviously you feel really excited. Like it's a, it's a win. You feel really happy, but you treat it kind of like, you know, after Silverstone where we thought we could have done a bit better there in the race. Um, and so I think like the excitement and the stress, they're all kind of metered because, you know, you have the same process, whether you win, whether you come second or 15th. Um, so, yeah, so I would say, like, I feel very excited. Um, it's cool that we're winning races. It's um, testament to the hard work by the team. Um, but I don't feel any more stressed than I did uh, earlier in the year. And we're hoping that the team mm. as a whole feels that way because I think we'll perform better without, you know, amping up the stress too much. I was wondering whether the stress would stop the heart rate from going up, you know, that's what I was... Check the charts. Check the charts. Mm. Randy, can we talk about the, um, the, big, the big issue that happened in Hungary of the switch? Because I immediately thought of you that day. Because, you know, we've, we've met a few times and we know how hard everyone works and how stressful a race is. Like, what, can you talk us through the famous switch, the, the, uh, the Lando giving the place back to Oscar? What was the... Because the, the radio was getting really frantic and there was a lot of chat, wasn't there? And the commentary were getting piling in and there was just so much chat about it. What, what's, your, what's your take on it all a few weeks later? Yeah, I guess, I guess what you see from what you, the snippets of radio that um, like the fans get to hear, not all the radio, and what's discussed on TV is like sometimes it's a tip of the iceberg. And often it gives a really good picture of what's going on. But like I'd say this was a tip of the iceberg and like the tip looked nothing like the iceberg. Um, we discuss that stuff like every Sunday morning. We uh, discuss it after each race, like Oscar and Lando will come to us with, uh, did you see what happened with this other team? Like, what would we do in that situation? And we build it into our plans and so on. And we're thinking actively about that as well. So you know, there's a lot of preparation for things like um, sequencing the cars, team orders, how we go racing within McLaren in a way that we don't ever compromise what our aim is, which is McLaren scores the most points possible. Um, so, yeah, so I can, uh, having watched it back uh, a while later, not immediately after uh, the TV footage, um, I can see how it's come across as this, like, really stressful situation. It wasn't, it wasn't really like that. It was fairly clear on the pit wall what we should do and why, and we have strong principles to mm. stick to. Um, and I know, you know, the drivers are driving, uh, I can't remember the top speed in Hungary, but, like, it's high. It's a difficult circuit to drive. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it can be hard to have, the like the very sort of slow paced rational conversations that you need to have in that situation like we can on the pit wall where we got the luxury mm. um so um so yeah so i think we we stuck to our principles of what we wanted to do um and yeah like what i think what people have heard is very different i mean i went i went up i was fortunate enough i was privileged enough to go up on the podium in hungary yes, um which and, i love to see yeah yeah and lando and oscar come in like still in the heat of the moment after getting out of the cars both were really ecstatic and happy i like, both congratulated each other and myself um yeah i think yeah it's very different after the race finishes and you don't have the stress of trying to make those decisions um, in the milliseconds effectively that you have in the race. Was it a really hard decision to make though at the time? It was, it was unusual. I think it was not a situation that uh, like, for example, Andrea and all myself had found ourselves in like uh, certainly not a McLaren in the past. Andrea, I think, probably has been in those situations elsewhere. Um, but we had strong principles. We stuck to the principles. So that makes it easy because we have, you know, we have an agreement that will always be fair um, across the drivers, how we'll approach the race. And so it was easy to say, well, actually, this morning we said this and, you know, this is our principle. Um, so, yeah, difficult in the sense that they, they've not been common for us, those situations. Um, but actually, it's been a good opportunity. The drivers have input very much into how we approach those situations going forwards. And so we sl sl slightly evolved our approach and we'll keep getting better at that stuff as well as we do it more. Was there a moment where you thought he's not going to give this place back? Uh, no. Uh, uh, not at all. Uh, like I think, yeah, I've uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with Lando since he joined the team. Uh, pretty much very similar times, um, and there was no doubt mm. uh, with Andre nor with myself on that. Randy, um, a question I kept getting asked a lot at the weekend on on you know fans of the podcast on social media was about starts, about McLaren's starts specifically. So yesterday I, I did a bit of research and watched back the starts to every race, be it Grand Prix or Sprint in the season. And noticed that Lando hasn't gained a position at the off the start this year. In fact, he's he's across the season lost thirteen places. 
whereas Oscar's gained seven off the start, lost one in the Netherlands, so taking his total down to six. So am I wrong? Is it a car issue where it's a little bit trickier to get the car off to the perfect start and maybe Oscar's dealing with that slightly better than Lando? It's something that people are asking a lot of questions about at the moment. Is there anything, any light you can shed on it for us? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... It's probably one of the most watched bits of the race, I imagine, the start of the race. So I can imagine lots of people see that and ask questions. Um, uh, Starts uh, is a loose term. So like, you know, up to turn one, we weren't the quickest in uh, Zandvoort and we lost a position with both cars. So it's definitely something that we're looking at after Zandvoort of what we can do better there. There's driver elements to that. Like the drivers have to react quickly. Um, They have to get the clutch uh, paddle in the right position. They have to... Um, did the right thing with the throttle as well. Uh, and then they have to position themselves. And then there's car and power unit elements to that as well. We have to estimate what the grip is and so on. Uh, the Zandvoort uh, study is still kind of going on. So I can't really comment on that one. I, w- I would say it's really tricky analyzing starts uh, because if you qualify first, you can only stay in first or fall backwards. And so it's really biased. Sometimes you look at it and you're like, oh, actually the team this year that's qualifying at the back has got the best launches. But no, it's it's just that they're qualifying at the back. Um, so we try and measure the launches in terms of distance rather than in terms of positions gained or lost. Um, uh, yeah. And so you look at how how long it takes you to cover 100 seconds um, or sometimes you look at like to each team's different how much distance you've covered in a number of seconds that tries to capture all the launch stuff but before you start you know battling with other people turning the car um and actually we're very competitive on our sort of assessment of that relative to other teams so yeah it's about finding those tiny little gains everywhere mm. what a fantastically weird sport this is I know, it's, I it's it. crazy I... And that was an ama- it was amazing to hear that randy thanks so much for being so um so open about it's, it all. It, but it's a great point as well because you know i think more often than not this year oscar's been behind Lando so Oscar will gain positions mm. whereas Lando might not in, in qualifying so though it, it's it's really really interesting while we're up while you mentioned Oscar quickly sorry Betty just very quickly we are so impressed with Oscar he, he must be continually impressing you and everyone around the McLaren setup because this this guy is he's now winning races since we I think we haven't spoken to you since he won his first race unbelievable what a guy yeah, he's doing amazingly well. Um, it's it's lovely to see it because you know when drivers join the team, like you kind of like you have the first year or so where they're getting kind of up to speed and bedding into the team, like we had with Lando several years ago. Um, and it's kind of cool to see how they develop through that. And I think um, Oscar's done incredibly well. Um, he's been thrown in at the deep end, I think, with a car that's so competitive, and he's really held his nerve. Like, um, mm. yeah, no, very, very impressed with Oscar. Gone then, Randy. Talk to us about Monza. What can we expect? Is it going to be a 23 second win what are you thinking? <laughs> uh, I hope it's more than that and it's for us but um, yeah um, keeping our feet on the ground it's a um, very different circuit to Sandvolt so things could change around um, we know that some people are bringing upgrades uh, you know uh, it's kind of that phase of the year where there's some now upgrades trickling through so some teams have mentioned that publicly a big thing is that the track's been fully resurfaced um, the whole thing oh. um, yeah some of the corners have slightly changed uh, turns one and two um, and then there's a couple of corners later in the lap. There's not many corners at the circuit, but they've slightly changed in terms of profile, we think. Um, so, yeah, a lot of our prep's been trying to understand the impact of the track changes, or the like pretty much the tarmac change. Um, we're going to see that in person today and tomorrow as well. Um, Monza tends to be a one-stop, um, like Zandvoort was as well, um, looking very dry this year, um, touch wood, um, and very hot, which especially with the new tarmac could be interesting because new tarmac tends to be darker and bitumen heavy, and it can get extremely hot um, yeah. as a result. Oh, God, I hope they've laid it properly because they've just made an awful mess up my road when they've put <laughs> in the fibre broadband. <laughs> oh, I should imagine God. it was the same company. Well, yeah, but this... I mean, there must be, surely there must be strict rules about resurfacing a race circuit. Where are we going with no, this? No, there must be. You can't just like suddenly be like, yeah, we've changed a couple of the, a couple of the cambers <laughs> are different. Uh, I think I think we did it quite well. Surely you can't just, just resurface a race circuit without anyone saying, yeah, that's okay. Can you? Well, there's certain, there's certain FIA regulations that yeah. they, they'll have to stick to. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't, it can't just be any old material. <laughs> But, uh, no, we've but... just put a speed bump in. Yeah, oh, right, yeah. exactly. Like you're just saying they've changed the profile of some of the corners. What? 
you're not allowed to do that. Yeah, it's it's they're very minor changes, and they will have been done in conjunction with the FIA. Um, and right. as Christian says, uh, this is going to sound really boring, but the tarmac, like what they can do with the drawings, etc., like everything is very strictly controlled. Well, I'm glad. Um, even, even like just checking for bumps, <laughs> that the FIA have a way of checking. Um, drivers hate the bumps with these cars because the cars are so low that the bumps really unsettle the cars. And so, uh, one of the biggest things the drivers will complain about to the um, FIA and F1 the bumps and the FIA have a way of measuring whether the bumps are within tolerance or not. So That is interesting. How do, how do they do that? Well, lasers. Lasers. I, oh, I don't know. Lasers. Good, with huge confidence at zero. <laughs> yeah, I, imagine, I imagine lasers. lasers. <laughs> and I'm going to be recommending this to Camden Council. Simon Ca- Lazenby goes out and does... <laughs> I'm going to recommend this to Camden Council because they could do a bit of mm. bump check-in. Randy, if you could win any item of clothing, <laughs> if you win Monza, what item? Uh... Yeah, what do you want to win when you win this time? Yeah. I really like wearing shorts. Don't carry trousers with me often. So, a pair of okay. orange shorts. So. A pair of shorts. A pair of orange shorts. Nice. He doesn't want for much. We'll, sit, we'll, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll, we'll let them know. He wants the Constructors' Championship, but more than that, he wants a pair of orange shorts. <laughs> and if we don't speak to you before, best of luck between now and the end of the season. Hopefully we do. We'll, we'll be getting him back on. He's a busy man. We're not his priority, are we? He's got shorts to find and races to win. Please please come back, Randy. Please we love you. Please come back, Randy. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure and uh, I'll pass on your uh, congratulations to the whole team. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, Randy. Randy. Thanks, Randy. Big up the papaya. Thank you. Woo! Pump up the papaya, I should say. Is that a thing? What... Um... Item of clothing would you guys want if, Ooh, great if you question. won a Grand Prix? Great question. I tell you what, at the moment, I'll keep it topical. Socks. I seem to be burning through socks at the moment. Oh, just, right. I, I put on a pair at the weekend in Zambor and like they like ripped in my hands as I was putting them on. So I'm just because <laughs> just I'm short of socks. <laughs> <laughs> it's short of socks. I'm short of socks at the moment. Good. Mm. They're also surprisingly expensive socks when you go to buy them. But anyway. Greg? Uh, I don't <laughs> I can't beat socks, I'm afraid. No. Socks. I was thinking of actually of merch, and I don't know why this popped into my head. Not necessarily clothes, but I wouldn't like. I'd mind. I quite like a kite. Oh, that's quite cool. I like quite that. Nice. I just, I don't, there's enough kites. You don't have many kites as an adult, do you? No, you don't get kites very often. Kites no. featured heavily in my childhood, and then there was just like a kite drop off. I don't know. Well, I the great it, kite drop off, as it's often referred. Yeah, the age of I don't know, eleven maybe. You sort of be like, yeah, don't like kites anymore. I feel like um, you could make a really good kite out of that cape that he had. Yeah, a kite well, cape. I mean, if anyone kite can cape. make a, a good kite, cape, kite, cape or kite, it would be. It would be McLaren. Yeah, imagine and McLaren kite strategy. Plenty of kite cape capers here on the Fast and the Curious. Oh yeah. no! Um, shall we talk a little bit about Logan Sargent then? No, I I'm, sort of, I'm talking about kites because I don't want to. No, <laughs> so we're sort of delaying it's it. Inevitable, isn't it? I feel sad about uh, that. Because he's a great man, and yeah. he did his very best. It's not a it's not a massive surprise that he's been dropped by Williams at all, is it? We all knew that it was going to happen. Were you surprised by the timing, though, Christian? No, not at all. I I, I was watching FP one in Zambor, and, and as soon as that crash happened, I just thought the right that that's it now. That I thought was the straw that broke the camel's back. And you've the, the writings on the wall because the car was in the wall. In because the, the car was in the wall. As soon as I thought, as soon as I saw that, I thought I don't think he can come back from this now. I, I wonder whether, like mentally, just the whole announcement. I don't know. Just of, every what, of Carla signs. Yeah, and just all of that happening. Th- what was it? Three weeks before he crashed. Whether that had a bit of an impact. I don't know. But, um, I don't think it will have helped. I think. Going right back to the start when Logan was put in the Williams seat, uh, you know, you look at other drivers like Jack Dewan will be getting his opportunity next year. He had three seasons in F2. Logan had less. Maybe Logan could have benefited from a bit more junior series experience. Yeah, I think he could. But would other drivers have taken the opportunity to be promoted maybe a little bit early and shown more pace straight away? Yes, they would. You know, we've seen, we've spoken in the past about drivers making their debut really, really young. I, I think it's unfortunate for Logan. I, I, I don't know him well. I know him from speaking to him on this podcast and for a few other bits. I've always really enjoyed talking to him. Always think he's a really nice guy. W- want to wish him all the best because he's a hugely talented racing driver who I think will probably end up in IndyCar and go and do a fantastic job. But I think the blunt reality is this is 
the top level of motorsport. This is the best of the best. And what we've seen with this podcast, you know, when we started last season and we were following the progress of Oscar Piastri and Logan Sargent as the rookies, they were both the first two drivers on this podcast. Mm. We've seen something very typical happening of, of what happens in F1. Some people fly mm. and rise like Oscar and some people ultimately don't make the cut like Logan. And unfortunately, he's not made the cut. And I'm, and I'm really sad about that. I think he'll be a lot happier doing something else. Yeah. Some, we've talked about this before, haven't we? That actually it's not for everyone. And it just sometimes doesn't work out. No, and, and it hasn't worked uh, out. And it's not the end of his racing career. Oh, no, but no. He is still one of the most talented, yeah. quickest drivers in oh, the world. To do what he has done. He's not disgraced himself at Williams. You know, to do what he has done. Mm. He is a huge talent and there was also a lot of inaccurate reporting when he got the job because his predecessor Nicholas Latifi was in there at a time when Williams needed money and were getting sponsorship no and they were saying oh it's the same with Logan or he's American and they're trying to attract the American fans you know he's an academy driver who they backed and mm. good for Williams for giving him a shot unfortunately it doesn't always work out in F1 we've also, seen that throughout the sports history he's reached his dream he made it for yeah. a bit like okay he's you know not winning but he got there and he competed in formula one not many people can say that they've done that i would also on a human level love to have him on the podcast still yeah, oh, I, I'd absolutely lo love to catch up with his story because i feel really invested in this guy now he's yeah. welcome and anytime you've had burgers with him in new york i've, I've spent a lot of time with Logan. You have, yeah. i did the launch in new york with yeah, him yeah. Did, ate a burger with him in new york as well <laughs> so i'd like That's i'd love it. to ca keep up with him because i think whatever he does next will be interesting yeah and he's clearly got a lot of fans and as we said is one of the quickest drivers in the world mm. just he just statistically is he managed to get to the top and it's very difficult as we know from history of this sport it's very difficult to stay there isn't it and the ones that do it just actually shows just how amazing some of the all-time greats are oh absolutely to, you know look at the your fernando alonso's and your lewis hamilton's they're still yeah. doing it come on then franco cola pinto tell us some stuff Argentinian, that's what I know. 21 years old. 21, I know that now. He's Argentinian. Yeah. He's 21. We've seen him this year because he drove at Silverstone in FP1. Uh, that's he free was practice one. Free practice free novices. one. Well done. You've always got to pick me up when I go to F1 geeky. Uh, he, was a, he was a respectable four-tenths off Alex Albon in that session. He also, that weekend, was racing in F2, where he was racing this weekend. Really difficult to combine an F2 weekend with an F1 weekend. So to get in the car and be four tenths off Alex is very impressive. He's had a very solid junior career, including winning Spanish F4 in 2019, third in Formula Renault uh, Europe Cup in 2020, and then um, raced in F3 in 22 and 23, fourth in F3 in 2023. And then he will leave the F2 championship this year in sixth place, having won a sprint race in Imola and been second in the feature race in Spain and Austria. So all in all, that adds up to a very, very solid junior career. And he's being given the chance at the very, very top level. Mm. Just to give a bit of context for those that might not know, how hard is it to make the podium? in Formula 2. Really hard so because all the cars are the same for a start and Formula 2 is a chaotic series. So yeah, to have that level, it's not coincidence that we're talking first in Spanish F4, third in the Formula Renault Europe Cup, as I say, fourth in F3 in 2023. These podiums, it shows a driver who's consistently competing up there at the top. That's why he gains backing from the likes of a Formula One team in Williams. It's not easy to achieve those results. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because we're not the only people that are surprised by oh, this I'm surprised. announcement I'm at surprised all. it's him. People weren't expecting it to be him. They, Mick Schumacher was rumoured, Liam Lawson, Kimi Antonelli. The, the two that were linked, well, three that were linked, because you're right, um, I don't, I, I think there was a, a desire to keep Kimi Antonelli in F2 to finish his F2 championship. So I don't think... Mercedes would have been up for, say, sticking him in too early. I think they wanted to get him to finish the championship. It had James Vowles had knocked on the door of Toto Wolff and said, can we borrow him for the rest of the year? Liam Lawson, I believe conversations did happen about Liam Lawson to try and borrow him from Red Bull. I think Red Bull are conscious that might they need to make a change before the end of the season in a battle for the Constructors' Championship. Is it beyond... Is it off the table completely that Sergio Perez is replaced at Red Bull wow. before the end of the season? No, I don't think it is. Plus, 
you know, we saw Liam race last year because he's the reserve driver for two Formula One teams, <laughs> Red Bull and RB. Mm. So, you know, they didn't want to be left in a situation without a backup plan. Wow. Mick Schumacher is the one that looks to be, as I got on the plane in Zambort, looks to be the favourite. I think the fact that he's been passed up by Alpine for the seat next year by Jack Doohan, the fact that he didn't have a seat last year or this year, the fact he's again been passed up by Williams suggests that for whatever reason, these people making the decisions in Formula One just don't have faith in Mick. And so Williams have done what they did with Logan. They've gone, let's give an opportunity to one of our reserve drivers. And I've seen a few people say, well, it's silly because he's not going to race for Williams next year. No, of course he's not. But we don't know a situation where Williams will get one of their drivers stolen in the future and need a replacement. Mm. You know, Albon and Sainz, that could happen. We also, there is a spot on the grid available next year. Sauber are still waiting on making their decision at who's going to partner Nico Hülkenberg. Bottas and Joe, both in the mix, neither of them confirmed. We've seen in the past when super sub appearances like Nick de Vries and teams go, actually, you're really good, aren't you? It's not beyond the realms of possibility. So it's really, really interesting and good for Williams for giving back into a young driver. So it's a good shop window for him, really. Great. The very there's, there's, best shop there, window. There, obviously, there's lots to lose, but really, there's nothing much to lose. It's not like he, he you know, he's not going to be driving for Williams next year because no, that's Carlos Sainz's it's, seat. But it, it's another... to, to, to give you the other side of the argument, surely it might not be overly beneficial for him to just take him out of... Formula 2. That, that is an argument people will raise. He, again, I said with Logan earlier, he might have benefited from a bit more F2 experience and he's only done half a season in F2. So yes, yeah. that is an argument you could put. But listen, they're not daft, these people. They, no. you know, now they know they, what they're doing. Yeah, so listen, good for Williams. They've They've given a young driver a chance and what a chance it is. It is indeed. Um, Afis... Afis Hag? Afis Hag, one of our listeners, has got in touch. He said, what will James Vowles be hoping that a less qualified driver than Logan will be able to do for them for the rest of the season? Well, let's use Zambort as an example. Alex had a great qualifying, um, was disqualified for technical infringement, and that immediately eliminated Williams' chances of scoring points because Logan wasn't up there, and Logan was almost never on the pace of Alex. They need a driver that is going to be much more capable speed-wise of being closer to Alex because every point counts. And really, Williams have been driving one hand. Alex has been the only one who looks capable of getting points. And also, they need someone not to crash as much. I think Logan's crash damage bill was too high. And I think maybe he'd have kept his seat to the end of the season if he was keeping it out the wall more often and just being off the pace. But once the two start to combine... I think that was writing on the wall for Logan. Makes sense, doesn't it? Mm. Let's move on to the George Russell Community Notice Board. <laughs> I feel like it needs a jingle, Greg. Jingle Greg. And, a, and, a, and an actual notice if board. If anyone's qualified to make a jingle. It is you. Yeah, I'm imagining sort of, um, what would it be? Sort of like, sort of like, a, like, a, a, like it's a gardening programme. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'm George thinking... Russell Community Notice Board. Do, 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 yeah, something genially something up there. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Do, like quite happy, do, do, quite do, upbeat. Do, 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. George Russell Notice <laughs> Board. Yeah. Do, yeah. Yeah, I like okay. it. We I like it. We, we did well there. That's an English country garden, but a George Russell Notice Board. On the George Russell Community no. Notice oh. Board. <laughs> no. Be careful because Greg's going to start making you try and hit that note. It's the George Russell No, it doesn't work. It doesn't say many things. We'd have to be it's the George Russell notice board. No, it doesn't. We'll, no, no, we'll work G it. Jimmy knows. Jimmy sat there. He knows exactly. Okay, we've got what an actual needs music producer. Like. Producer Jimmy producer. at the back. Of, right, no. Jimmy, make a jingle. Lovely, great. Uh, <laughs> please, if you, could, if you could sort that out, that'd be fabulous. Thank you. Um, in the middle of George Russell Community Notice Board, George we've got Community <laughs> Notice Board. <laughs> is Kimi Antonelli. Oh. Uh, Let's yeah. talk about this because I look at this and I think, well, here we go. Surely the writing's on the wall. We said the writing's on the wall earlier, but... There could be more writing on the bloody wall. There's so the much writing on the wall. The, walls. the writing's on the wall because it's on the community notice board. Mm. Yeah. So... But surely he is going to have that seat at Mercedes now. Well, firstly, don't call me Shirley. Secondly, um, <laughs> I believe he is going to get that seat. It's not just me who believes that. We've had people like Alex Jakes and Will Buxton on this podcast who've said the same thing. Everybody in F1 thinks it's going to be him. I mean, if it isn't, you know, 
it might be you, Betty, because uh, yeah, you know well. they've met, signs has gone to Williams. I'll do everyone a good else, job. yeah, everyone else has been snapped up. I mean, goodness knows who they are going to give it to if they're not going to give it to Kimmy. What what I haven't said is that he will be driving for Mercedes in free practice one this week. Well, that was what I was that's, about to that's say. The yeah, the news line here. Yeah, well, now he's getting this opportunity this weekend. I mean, I've got. I, by the way, no information, inside info here. I'm oh, purely I'm speculating. Fat you are. Yeah. He, thanks. <laughs> he he is Italian, right? Italian Grand Prix in Monza. They're giving him the FP1 uh, slot. It would make sense to announce it this weekend because the one thing, I, uh, to give a bit of inside info, I do think he's going to get the seat. I really do. But We've always thought this, though. Since, yeah, well, we, since we got Bradley on the podcast, yeah. we were all like, it's got to be Kimmy, I will be it? astonished if it's not him. Astonished. But uh, it, it would seem to me to be a good weekend to announce it. So maybe that's what they're planning. Maybe he goes out, does a great job in FP1, and then they say, yeah, and he's in for next year, and what a wonderful thing. What if he thing. does a bad job? Well, well great well, question. Ask Bradley um, Lord. I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't think he will. But, I, 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 you know, the thing is, you don't hear anyone in the F1 paddock say... Oh, I think this will be too soon for him. Or, oh, I'm not sure about Oh, it's too much hype. Everybody you speak to at Mercedes, everybody, any paddock chatter from people in other teams, they go, yeah, apparently this kid's special. Paddock chatter. We could have... <laughs> We should have called this podcast that. Paddock chatter. <laughs> Paddock chatter. Maybe, maybe if we get bored of the community notice board, that's this segment's George new name. George Russell's Paddock chatter. <laughs> Paddock chatter. I thought, yeah, I quite like that. Paddock chatter. <laughs> Are we retiring George Russell's community notice board for Paddock no, chatter? No, no. Oh, look, it's time for Paddock chatter. That's good. You know what it is time for? It's time to wrap this up and go to the pub. Yes. Quick fire predictions for Monza. I think it's going to be great. Chris, Greg, <laughs> I think Kimi Antonelli will drive an FP1. Ooh, well, on I, that. I, I think Lando Norris is going to win again. Do All right? you? That's what I feel. I feel that in my bones. The thing is, no idea, because until you get into FP1 at the moment, you just don't know who's quick. And Mercedes could be quick again. McLaren could be way quick. So I'm going to pick a driver at random. I think the race will be what I think... Ferrari are going to have bought upgrades, are going to turn the engine Ferrari. up. I think Charles Leclerc will win the Italian nice. Grand Prix. Yeah, That's, nice. really That's what I'm shout. going for. Is that based off your own intuition or is that paddock chatter? Intuition, not chatter. Mm. Paddock chatter. Paddock chatter. Anyway. I'm with paddock that. chatter. And with that, it's time to end this podcast. Would you like to see us home? Get us back into the port? Get us back into the... Drive the ship home, Come shall on, I? Drive it home. Um, wow. Well, Thanks, guys. It's been thank a you. pleasure as always. No, Betty, if you've got Betty, any questions... Betty, thank you. Oh, thank you. It's been great. If you've got any questions, slide into our DMs at Fast Curious Pod, wherever you get your social media. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back <laughs> after the Monza Grand Prix with our race debrief. God bless. Good night. Take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs> Good evening. 